brief introduction and Associate Professor Dr. Subhapriya. She is an Associate Professor of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine with diverse special interests in neuroimaging and neuroscience. She has had numerous publications on functional MRI, diagnostic imaging of Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative disorders, nuclear diagnostic and nuclear oncology imaging. She is the founder and president of NeuroCorp Society Malaysia and the head of Nuclear Imaging Unit, Hospital Sultan Abdul Aziz Shah, UPM. Without further ado, we would like to welcome Prof. Madhya Dr. Subhapriya Supya to give her talk on cross-sectional MRI, PET-CT and PET-CT neuroanatomy and understanding functional networks in the brain. Thank you very much for the Masters of Ceremony. Thank you for the Masters of Okay, very good morning to all our uh, honored participants, uh, to our uh, program director, Dick Khalil, uh, Muhammad Khalil Saleh, and our committee members from both uh, Unit Pengimikan Nuclear Hospital, uh, Sultan Abdul Aziz Shah, UPM, and also NeuroCorp Society committee members. Thank you everyone for making this uh, event possible and hope we have a blessed day learning uh, exciting new things. Okay, so today um, my first talk is on cross-sectional MRI spec and PET CT. But let me take you through our experience here in UPM, the exciting research that we have done. Okay, so uh, one of the research I did with my master's student is about doing functional MRI for addiction. It was Instagram addiction and how it affected the brain. So this is how uh, it is seen in the uh, MRI in functional imaging. We can see the activities in different regions of the brain, which indicated that those were more addicted, had more um, impulsivity. They couldn't uh, have this ability to control the impulse and they continuously went towards what they were addicted. So it was something already in the brain uh, that had chemical changes and could be seen in function. So these are things that we can prevent with proper knowledge, understanding of the neurobiology. So that's one of the importance of doing, doing neuroimaging. Uh, next, it was a study on smartphone addiction in general in emerging young adults and looking at the brain morphometry. One of my master in medicine student, Dr. Aida, who's also one of our committee members now, she has joined as our service-based radiologist at UPM Hospital. Uh, she conducted the study with our team and noted that there were even structural brain changes, like the precuneus in the brain was shrunken in the addicted. So as time goes, you can even change the anatomy of the brain, uh, certain disorders, including addiction. And another study, uh, it was a review of many other studies. So it was a systematic review with one of my PhD students. We diagnosed Alzheimer's disease using functional MRI. And this also can be seen in various brain imaging, certain patterns that recur. Maksudnya ada perubahan otak yang berulang dalam pesakit Alzheimer's. Mungkin kita boleh lihat di peringkat awal. Uh, dia tidak perlu kita tunggu sampai otak dia kecut. We don't have to wait for brain shrinkage. There are some early changes that occur functionally. Okay, and then uh, this, I'm very happy. I published it in an Indonesian journal with collaboration from my Indonesian counterpart. The pattern of various FDG pet uh, uh, patterns in Alzheimer's, in various different uh, presentations, clinical presentation. We can see some different patterns on the. Uh, glucose analog PET CT scan, which is another imaging modality that we will talk through in other lectures today. Okay, and another review and sharing of images from experience from a fellowship training in the UK, talking about amyloid PET, which is a different radio tracer used for Alzheimer's disease, which is more specific to look at amyloid pathology. So now we go into today's lecture more specifically. So what are you going to get from today's first lecture. You will learn what is different brain regions, what are the brain lobes involved. Uh, understand what is functional MRI, know that there are six lobes of the cortex and eight resting state uh, functional connectivity networks, which are the most important networks. Okay, so let me take you through this. Uh, so this is the image diagrammatic representation of the brain uh, and it shows you the 
uh, lobes of the brain. So this is the frontal lobe, this is the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and two other lobes more medially that we don't see in this image. But you can, we will give you notes later, so you can read this later. So there's also the insula lobe that has some functionally separate activity action and the limbic lobe. So these are anatomy that we know based on the skull. There's different skulls that connect, skull bones connect together and there are salsa and gyri that separate these anatomical lobes. But functionally, there are also various segments in function. They may be next to each other and share similar function like Brodmann areas. This was done on autopsy patient. Maksudnya patient tu dah meninggal, mereka bedah otak dia dan mereka kenal pasti certain areas of the brain. And then uh, Brodmann ni dia juga ada uh, Later on, ada orang develop uh, homunculus of Penfield pula. They use EEG and they look at the simulation of our motto and sensory. So they find out that in our parietal sensory motor cortex, these are areas representing different body parts. So that is the homunculus of Penfield that is focused to this part of the brain in the parietal lobe. So there are various ways we can classify brain lobe, either anatomy, functional, uh, using various modalities. Now we come to a bit more on imaging. Okay, how MRI can help us in a non-invasive manner? Kita tak payah bedah mayat, kita boleh scan orang tu, kita boleh tahu keadaan otak dia, anatomy dia macam mana. So these are some MRI images of uh, cross-section MRI. This is a coronal image. We call coronal when we cut front to behind. Then we can slice the image according to front to behind, that's coronal. From top to down, that's called axial, and from side to side, it's called sagittal. These are some imaging terminology. Okay, so for the coronal view, we can see full on from the front, which is something you will be familiar with, like the normal shape of the brain here, and then here is the brain stem, okay, that connects to the rest of the nervous system. Uh, and in we have here some fluid in the brain, yeah. Ini adalah kecair dalam otak yang panggil CSF. Cerebrospinal fluid. Dia untuk uh, memelindungi otak. It's protecting the brain from kocakan and it has some uh, nutrients in it and it also clears up certain toxins. So CSF has a lot of function. Okay, and then we see the brain tissue. We have outside here the grey matter and inside is white matter and some deep grey matter in, embedded deep inside. So we can see on this scan if the CSF is dark. Usually, uh, this means is T1 weighted scan. Okay, in MRI we have T1 weighted, T2 weighted, and various other sequences. We have flare. So for the gray matter, when it appears dark like this outside, um, and the white matter is relatively brighter, and CSF is dark, this is a T1 weighted image. Okay, so here is an example of T2 weighted image here, NPD. Okay. So it's like a bit of T1 and T2, you get a PD. Like you see here, uh, this MRI, we have things we call TR and TE. TR means time to repeat. TE means time to echo. So the machine is actually uh, having a radio frequency pulse. You will hear the pulse and then it goes and it affects our molecules. Our water molecules in our body will align according to the magnet in the MRI scanner. So there's a big magnet with very strong field of magnetic energy that can affect our water molecules. But you know our body is still the same. We are not distorted. But it's the water molecules inside our body that can arrange according to the magnetic field. So when the radio frequency pulse is given by the machine, then the alignment will change. From being aligned to the magnetic pole, it can flip to a transverse magnetization, we call it. And they are excited. So now the molecules are excited because of the radio frequency pulse. Okay, macam dia dengar music ni, dia tengah excited, dia pun dengar menari-nari kat bawah tu. Bila off music, dia pun nak berdiri tegak balik. Okay, so now the atoms want to align back. Tapi tak semua atom berdiri sama waktu. Okay, macam budak tadi kan juga ada yang lambat sikit nak naik, ada yang cepat. Okay, so these atoms take time to go back to this longitudinal. And this is the different times will give you different signals. Who come up faster will give signal faster and they become brighter faster. Okay, so it depends on the TR and TE. Okay. 
So then we get to see all the different structures in the brain. And we see uh, the, the sagittal view here. Okay, the sagittal view gives you um, uh, the, the whole uh, CSS in this way. And you can see the brain stem nicely here. You can see this is a medulla oblongata. Uh, this is the uh, midbrain. This is the pons and this is the medulla oblongata. Okay, this is the brain stem. And this is the brain frontal lobe here, parietal lobe here. And then the temporal lobe you cannot see because it's more laterally. And then you can see the occipital lobe here. So there are all the colorful lines are the sulci. They separate the different lobes of the brain. Okay. And this one is axial view, top to bottom. You can see the eye, eyeball here. You, can you guess it's T1 or T2? Is it? T2, yeah? Because you see the eyeballs are so bright. CSS here bright. So this is a T2 weighted image. Okay, in T2 weighted image, the, the gray matter is brighter. Okay, and the, the white matter becomes darker. So it's a flip of the T1 weighted. Okay, these are more anatomical images showing you different uh, sulci separating the different lobes of the brain. Okay, so now we come to how we can do big data analysis. So we we can do MRI, but how can we come to early diagnosis, do big data analysis? We need software. We need software that help us to analyze in a more accurate manner. We can get quantification. We can get maps, you know, of where there are activations that then we can have be more accurate than just eyeballing. Okay, so there are various uh, brain maps that have been created to implement this atlas into software. For example, the Montreal Neurological Institute MNI, MNI brain map, which can be uh, from an MRI scan, it locates different regions of the brain, so we can identify specific regions. Kita tak perlu bedah mayat, kita ada atlas untuk bantu kita. Okay. So this is about how bold imaging or functional imaging is utilized for us to get contrast even without injecting anything into the patient. Okay, pengaliran darah di dalam otak ada perbezaan. Kawasan yang aktif ada dapat lebih banyak oksigen. Jadi perubahan kepekatan oksigen pada sesuatu kawasan boleh memberi uh, area tu lebih cerah. Jadi kita boleh nampak sebagai kontras dalam otak. Okay, perbezaan oksi dengan dioksi hemoglobin akan memberikan different gambaran dalam functional MRI. Itulah cara dia berfungsi. Melihat uh, flow of oxygen secara indirectly memberikan, secara tidak langsung memberikan uh, gambaran uh, fungsi neuron dalam otak. Bila ada satu thought, satu activity yang dijalankan oleh neuron, impuls elektrik berjalan. Tapi kita tak menggambarkan elektrisiti yang berjalan, kita tengok blood flow. Itu indirectly we are looking at neuron activation. activation. Okay. So these are the maps that we can get in the end. The blood flow map, we call it the hemodynamic response function, you can see the map and then we can see different brain activation based on different function or activity. Okay, these are various pictures. Even during rest, our brain is functioning. That's why our brain uses a lot of oxygen and glucose. Walaupun kita tidur, otak kita pakai oxygen. Kerana dia berfungsi walaupun dia berehat. Uh, untuk memelihara kita. Kalau kita dengar bunyi, kita boleh terbangun kan? Walaupun tidur tu tidur. But sometimes we can just be alert because our brain is actually collecting information all around us, even at rest. And to preserve our survival. So our brain is ready for flight if there's danger. Okay? So there are various uh, ways our brain functions. There are various, uh, kita kata, networks dalam otak. Mereka berfungsi dalam frekuensi yang berasingan. Uh, frekuensi ni banyak color dia. Okay? Ada yang frekuensi tinggi, frekuensi rendah. Tetapi macam mana kita nak tahu which brain lobes or which brain regions are giving out this function. Okay. Susah sikit kan? Sebab banyak jenis function, kita tak tahu, tahu mana satu. Contoh dia sama seperti kalau kita ada jamuan, ada majlis, makan-makan. Uh, Semua orang bercakap. Tapi kita boleh dengar apa yang kawan kita cakap dengan kita. Kita pun boleh communicate dengan orang seberang daripada kita. Kerana frekuensi tu, dia boleh tangkap sama frekuensi. Okay, like that, we can also do um, independent component analysis. Maksudnya, uh, software boleh analisa komponen yang ada frekuensi yang sama dan mereka berlaku pada waktu yang serentak 
This one kita identify sebagai network yang ada saling hubung kait. Walaupun mereka jauh dari each other, we brain. Uh, they are one network. So these are ways we can interpret functional MRI. Okay. Um, this is fit based. Contohnya bila kita dah banyak analisa, kita akan tahu tempat-tempat ni interrelated. Jadi kita boleh zoom in kepada mereka dan fit tu maksudnya note different areas of the brain and then kita boleh uh, analyze them. We can actually uh, list down. Okay, kita macam menu. I nak area-area ni. Okay, you dah select dah. And then kita nak tahu macam mana fungsi dia. So we can also do fit based analysis using software. Okay, it's like a menu that you call up. So when we do this functional analysis, we need to know a little bit how to use the software. You know in radiology, we have DICOM image. It's the way to communicate any machine, you can get the image. But if it's in a DICOM format, you can read it anywhere with a DICOM reader. So you can look at image, you can share it remotely. You, you get this DICOM image, you con convert it to NIFTY. So there are software to convert it to the NIFTY format. And then you do other pre-processing like uh, co-registration, normalization, uh, you need to do smoothing. So all this you want to then register it to a template of uh, MNI Atlas and then you can identify brain regions. Kamu juga boleh analisa 100 patient pun sekaligus menggunakan this kind of computational software. Okay, for more than 100 or so. So there are various networks identified using functional MRI. And I will let you know eight networks now. Uh, this is going to conclude our lecture with these eight networks. So let's go through it together. So what are the eight uh, most common networks that you see in the resting state? We have the visual network. Okay, so various regions of the brain will communicate and perform the visual function. Okay, then we have auditory network. This is for hearing. So these areas, uh, they function together to perform auditory function. Okay. And then we have somatomotor network. So various regions of the brain are interrelated to perform a somatomotor kind of uh, function. One of the predominant areas is the, as you know, homunculus of Penfield region. Yeah? Like tadi ada gambar muka, tangan, kaki. Okay. Then the dorsal attention network. Uh, this one is to see uh, what are you paying attention to. So this region. So you can give certain images and if this area lights up, that means you really want to pay attention. So you can actually tell what people are paying attention to, you know. Okay, so interesting. And then the limbic network. This is the network that indicates our very primitive network and our intrinsic feelings and our memories can all be embedded here. And this is what we are motivated. If our limbic system says this is good, we are motivated to go for it. So if you think, uh, Okay, you want to look a lot on Instagram, then your limbic system gets very activated when you look at Instagram feed. Okay, but if you uh, think, okay, some people with food addiction, okay, they see the food they like, their limbic system is going to light up. Okay, and same with addiction, cocaine addict. They have done studies uh, with uh, showing images related to their addiction. This area lights up. So this area really shows our primitive impulsiveness where we want to. Um, go towards something which is not easy to inhibit. Inhibition occurs from our frontal uh, executive control, which I will talk uh, soon. We also have another attention network that gives salience to whatever we think and believe. And this is the central executive control network that I mentioned earlier. So it's mainly in the frontal lobe and this uh, will help us to inhibit certain impulses. So kita kata, Oh, we eaten enough, 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 stop now. So the frontal lobe will give you feedback and then you stop. But if the limbic is too active, you say, no, no, I don't want to stop. Keep quiet, the central frontal executive. So the central has no power there. So it depends. If we want to activate this, there are ways. Okay? Cognitive function, how we want to uh, stimulate our executive control so that we can uh, improve our function. Okay. And then this is the last but not least very important network called the default mode network. Various resting states, this is the most active network that um, functions at a very basal level. So this default mode network is one of the uh, earliest to be affected in disease. So we can see patterns in healthy versus the disease subject. Default mode network uh, derangements occur very early. 
Okay, so this we always analyze medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex. All these are very important for early impairment of brain function. Okay. So this is an image of DMN, how you can see it in the, in the functional MRI image. Okay. The intensity bar here on the right, you can actually denote how intense is it in the medial prefrontal cortex, in the posterior cingulate cortex. So uh, this indicates uh, the DMN activation here. Okay, then uh, various functional connectivity hypothesis is there indicating uh, activations of the default mode network. Okay, so in summary, uh, functional imaging can help diagnose an illness or disorder, understand the neurobiology of this disorder, identify early changes that can guide treatment planning and monitoring, and even aid in the development of novel treatment. Okay, so with that, I thank you. And we'll have Q&A towards the end before our break. Okay, thank you very much.